So Dr. Christos Georgiatis couldn't be here today. He had a work-related medical emergency and had to travel to Saudi Arabia. Um, so she asked me to fill in for him last minute and happy to be here. Um, although I'm not an expert in hyperhidrosis, I am very familiar with this procedure. So I'll go through his slides and try my best to answer any questions you may have. Okay. So hyperhidrosis is a production of excessive amount of sweat that interferes with daily activities. Um, this is not just a social um, embarrassment or um, isolated disease. It's now considered as a part of this autonomia spectrum of disease. Um, it's primarily caused by autonomic dysregulation, just like POTS disease. Um, and a lot of the patients who get referred to us for hyperhidrosis treatment also have um, Current diagnosis of POTS, irritable bowel syndrome, Raynaud's disease, um, chronic nausea and vomiting, and chronic pain syndrome. So this excessive sweating usually um, present as a cluster um, of disease in different areas of the body. Um, a lot of patients actually present with just primarily head and neck sweating. Um, sometimes they can present with palms and the, the, the axilla um, sweating. Um, some patients have just primarily torso sweating, including the abdomen, back, and their groin areas, and um, less commonly in just the feet. And it is thought to um, affect specific dermatomes, which are basically um, um, nervous system supply to certain areas of the skin uh, from the spinal nerves. Again, hypohydrosis is not just a social inconvenience. It can affect patients' lives very significantly. A lot of those patients can drive, they can type, they can shake hands. Um, they have to change clothes multiple times throughout the day. And this can obviously lead to significant psychosocial issues. Um, they suffer from depression, isolation, bullying. Um, it's very difficult for them to sustain long-term employment or long-term um, relationships. We actually had two of our patients um, who were referred for CT guided sympatholysis who attempted suicide in the past. There are two types of hyperhidrosis. Um, the one that we're focusing today is primary hyperhidrosis. Secondary hyperhidrosis has underlying either iatrogenic or traumatic insult um, that defines the, the day or time when um, the patients start developing hyperhidrosis. Whereas primary hyperhidrosis is um, an overproduction and over secretion of acetylcholine, which is a signal um, that activates um, end organs, uh, whether it's cardiovascular system, um, respiratory system, or um, gastrointestinal system. So the end organ itself, just like sweat glands, um, they're functionally normal, however, they keep getting overproduction of signal mechanism that keeps um, activating them. So that's what's causing the primary hyperhidrosis. Um, it's thought to um, affect about 9 million patients in the states um, with prevalence of, a, of about 3%, but we are suspecting that this is underdiagnosed disease. Um, Many of you may know family members or friends who suffer from this condition, but they had never thought that this is a serious medical problem and um, might not have been clinically and effectively diagnosed as of yet. Um, so the actual clinical diagnosis of primary hyperhidrosis requires any of those two of these symptoms. Um, a lot of our patients actually present with all of these symptoms. Um, they're never unilateral. A lot of them have bilateral and relatively symmetric distribution of the sweating um, phenomena. And um, this can impair their daily activities um, frequently at least one time a week. Um, most of them present with daily symptoms of overproducing um, sweats. And most of the patients are um, diagnosed before they turn 20 years old. Some of them have positive family history. I understand that there are some studies um, going on right now that try to um, see if there's any familial correlation with hyperhidrosis. Um, and those patients actually stop sweating throughout night because when they sleep, their um, autonomic or sympathetic nervous system shuts down. 
Once you're diagnosed with clinical, um, clinically significant hyperhidrosis, um, your disease severity can be um, tabulated into four different score systems. So the patients who have grade one disease um, basically are normal people. They don't rarely notice any sweating. Um, patients who are uh, diagnosed with grade two disease, um, they notice more common sweating than normal people, but they can deal with it. They don't seek any medical help most of the time, and um, they, they consider them tolerable symptoms. However, if you are diagnosed with grade three disease, um, these um, sweating symptoms can be barely tolerable. Um, they interfere with daily activities, and um, it can be as bad as grade four, where it's never tolerable, and they always feel wet. Um, the patients who have grade three disease can usually manage with medical um, management, um, and they avoid certain social situations, and, and they can cope with their symptoms. However, the patients who have grade four disease nothing really helps them and they are just miserable. Um, so the patients who get referred to us from, um, from Dr. Brock, who's a cardiothoracic surgeon and the director of the sweat um, gland disorders, um, usually have grade three or four hyperhidrosis. Um, as an interventional radiologist, we offer multiple various um, minimally invasive procedures under imaging guidance, whether it's ultrasound, CT, um, live x-ray, or sometimes MRI. Um, one of the procedures that Dr. Georgiades um, introduced was CT guided sympatholysis. Um, so it's basically image guided disruption of the paravertebral sympathetic chain. Um, so by eliminating the overstimulation, the source of the overstimulation um, where the acetylcholine is produced, um, it is thought to prevent the sweat gland to um, respond um, more than it should. So this is an animation of um, the, the sympathetic ganglion. It's basically bundles of nerves um, that runs interlateral aspect of the vertebral bodies in the in the spine. So you can see that the sympathetic ganglion. I'm, I know I'm not supposed to walk away from it. Um, basically runs. Um, in this location, and this is an MRI image um, that kind of correlates with this an anatomic illustration. And you can see that on MRI, it's actually quite noticeable. It looks more round and it has better definition on MRI images. And um, you can see that it's, its relationship with intercostal nerve, which is in close proximity to the sympathetic ganglion. So it's interesting because one of the complications associated with this procedure is actually intercostal nerve neuralgia. And that is one of the reasons. I just wanted to point that out because I will um, talk about that later. So this is an image of the actual procedure. So um, the patient is laying prone. So the, the on top of the image is actually your back skin. And um, you're laying uh, with your abdomen at the bottom of the, the image. Um, and that is the the vertebral body that is seen here, and that's on CT image. Um, the red arrows indicate the needle. It's a 22 gauge needle that we use to inject alcohol into the sympathetic ganglia. Um, as you can see, compared to the MRI image, CT images is not as well defined. It's a little lower resolution, and um, we have to use landmark in order to target that specific area instead of actually visually identifying the, the actual structure. This is another patient um, that we injected alcohol to the, um, to the sympathetic ganglion. Um, so we use this needle, so it's directed from the skin all the way down to the paravertebral space under CT guidance. Um, it's minimally invasive. We actually perform these procedures without much sedation. They just probably get one dose of opioid and they rarely complain of any pain. Um, this just feels like more of a pressure and, you know, in and out of the, the procedure room, it literally takes about 15 minutes for us to perform this procedure. 
Um, Excuse me, what yeah. level? So yeah, I'm going into that right now. <laughs> um, so this is a picture taken during a procedure. So as you can see, the patient is laying prone um, on his on his belly, and we sterilely prep the back. And um, the, there are three levels that we're treating. T2 is thoracic spine level, second thoracic spine to fourth thoracic spine. So T2 level is thought to in innervate um, the head and neck region whereas three and four um, supply the axilla and, and palma um, areas. So if you are referred for just a primarily head and neck hyperhidrosis, we just treat T2 level. Um, but if you have combination of all of those, then you can get treatment at all three levels, whereas sometimes we would just do isolated T2 and T3 levels for, um, for isolated axilla and palma hyperhidrosis. So these are very small needles, and again, um, in order to place them at the exact correct location, it takes about, if we're doing all um, six locations and three levels, it will take about 30 minutes. Um, so once the needle is in place, we do another safety check by aspirating um, to make sure we're not getting any blood back, which would mean that it is in the, another vascular structure or venous structure in the area. Um, then we inject lidocaine, a very small amount of lidocaine, which is short-acting anesthetic. Um, the reason we do that is because we want to test to see if this is going to cause any adverse reaction. Um, because we are targeting sympathetic ganglion that innervates other areas of the body, we want to make sure this is not going to um, cause significant or profound um, side effect. So the things that we care most about, especially at T2 level, is a Horner syndrome. And I have a slide next um, that kind of goes over what that entails. So we do, after we inject the lidocaine, we do mini um, neuro exam and cranial nerve exam to make sure everything looks intact. We also check for any upper and lower extremity sensory and motor changes, any change in vision. And we generally just ask the patient how they feel. So once this is done, um, then we can get to the treatment. So the Horner syndrome is um, basically um, a clinical symptoms, um, a triad of clinical symptoms, including ptosis, meiosis, and anhydrosis, which are just droopy eyelid, uh, loss of sweating, which is what we want, and pupillary constriction. These are caused by disruption of the sympathetic autonomic nervous system to the facial region. Um, so you can imagine since we're targeting that area, this can happen while we're injecting lidocaine. So that's the one that we're, we're primarily concerned about. If you don't have any of these symptoms, then we can proceed to treatment. With the needle in the same place, we can inject 100% alcohol. So alcohol is thought to disrupt the any structure. So we use alcohol injection to um, many different organs throughout the body, not just at the sympathetic chain. Um, and it actually can permanently uh, disrupt the, the organ and organ system. So we use 1.5 cc, which is a very small amount for T2 level, um, mostly because um, we think that it may cause more Horner syndrome, more profound Horner syndrome if T2 level is disrupted. And for T3 and T4 levels, we use 2 cc on each side. Um, and once that's injected, we again wait a few minutes and do a neuro exam and to make sure that they don't have any adverse reaction. Again, this is a procedure itself is not painful until we inject the alcohol. Um, some people react more um, um, in a bad way than other people, but the pain itself is triggered by the alcohol. Um, it's a very sharp pain, um, but fortunately it only lasts about 10 seconds. So that dissipates and goes away, so some patients require more pain medication during the procedure. Um, this is a post-procedure CT scan of the thorax, um, basically demonstrating in the area that of interest there is more soft tissue thickness now and um, some gas on the left side and that's normal after the procedure. These patients stay in the PACU for about an hour and they go home. Um, we do another repeat neuro exam before they get discharged home. 
um, then we call them um, with follow-up phone call about a week after discharge and they follow with Dr. Brock um, in person in about four weeks for more um, sustained and, and um, further follow-up. Once we inject this alcohol, um, the patients actually respond immediately on the table. Their hyperhidrosis stops immediately. Um, some patients don't, and um, Dr. Georgiades wasn't sure why that was, and he believed that it might be lidocaine contribution to symptoms. Um, and some of those patients who have immediate um, benefit after the injection um, and have just complete dryness, they can um, have recurrence of symptoms after two to three days. Um, so that's another thing that we're looking into. Um, again, like I mentioned earlier, because of the location and the proximity of the, the intercostal nerves, you can have intercostal nerve neuralgia after this procedure, um, which was seen in about 15% of our patient population. Most of the patients had temporary pain um, for about two weeks or so that was managed with some opioids. Um, there were three patients who had more prolonged symptom required Lyrica for up to six months. Um, if their symptoms recur or there's a treatment failure, they can always come back and get repeat treatment. Um, this is just a diagram of showing the efficacy of the CT guided sympatholysis. For craniofacial sympatholysis, um, the, the long term efficacy is up to um, 70 to 75 percent, whereas for axillary palma area, it's only about 50 percent. So overall efficacy of about 60 to 65 percent. Um, we believe that um, it might be because of the localization of the needle uh, may not be as accurate if we have to inject all three levels at six different sites. As I mentioned earlier, MRI has such a great definition of anatomic um, structures, whereas CT just kind of looks like a blob of soft tissue in that area, but we just use anatomic landmarks to target it. Um, the reason we don't use MRI for this procedures is because one, um, that would actually take about four hours instead of 30 minutes, and two, all the equipment that goes into the MRI has to be MRI compatible, and that would require more uh, planning and different type of equipment that we're not, um, we're not doing as of yet. Um, so those are the reasons. And, and as you can see, the efficacy can drop down after um, four to five months. Um, we think they might be because of regeneration or repair of the treated nerves. We actually had um, of 60 patients who were treated with this um, procedure. We had 10 patients who also had concurrent diagnosis of POTS, and two of them had complete resolution of POTS after this treatment. Um, and there were a few other patients who had um, much, much improvement in their symptoms afterwards, which is interesting. Um, a few complications that can happen after this procedure, again, um, intercostal nerve neuralgia um, can be seen in up to 15% of the patients. Um, some patients actually develop delayed Horner syndrome, so that can be, that can also happen after this procedure. Um, another thing that we have been seeing in about 10 to 15% of the patients is compensatory hyperhidrosis. So for example, if you're treated for craniofacial hyperhidrosis, um, if, even if they go dry in the head and neck, they can actually develop more sweat um, in other areas, in their groin, in their feet, and that happens only if they were completely treated and successfully treated with the CT guided sympatholysis. Okay, and I believe that's the last slide.